Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie, and I'm here with Rob Abasolo. Super excited to talk to you, Rob. Welcome to the show. How you doing, man? And hey, you know what? Kudos to you, man. Uh, you pronounce my name correctly. I get a lot of people that say Abasolo, Obosola. Yeah, I've, I've heard them all at this point. So you did your research, man. Congrats. I try. I try my best. It's, it's a weakness, <laughs> so I work on it. Um, but here we go. I wanted to, uh, first of all, say that I really respect you. And through the research, I was just learning more and more about you. And it just, it was resonating with me. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that you really have built this sort of real estate empire, we'll call it, but you started from square one and Mm -hmm. you took the time to not only educate yourself, but more importantly, took the early risks. And I would imagine that nearly all of our listeners have imagined owning their own, say, Airbnb income rental property at one point or another. What advice do you typically give to those people who are on the verge of building their portfolio and, and are trying to get started? You know, there's a few things that I always say people like the, you can approach this so many ways, Trey. I would say ultimately there is no right or wrong for this stuff. There's just what's right for you. And honestly, it really depends on where you are in your life and how much capital you have and all that stuff. But my first piece of advice for most people, honestly, like if they really want to get into real estate, I try to get people to stop paying their mortgage. Uh, and what I mean by that is how can you subsidize your mortgage in a way that allows you to stash that cash to basically allow you to invest, right? So really great example of this. My favorite uh, example of this actually is a house hack. For me, I was house hacking really since the very first house that I purchased. I lived in Kansas City. I think our mortgage was like $159,000. And our mortgage, I think was like $1,050, um, which was sizable. That was like 25% of our of our take home at that point. We brought in a, a roommate and he was paying us $400 a month. And I was like, oh my goodness, we are rich. We've done it. And we moved to LA and uh, still still relatively broke, by the way. And we bought a house that was four times as expensive and we still house hacked. We um, It had a studio underneath and then I rented out the guest room to a buddy of mine. And then I rented out the studio on Airbnb. And you know, between that and my other Airbnb that I had just launched, I wasn't paying a mortgage. And my mortgage on that house was about $4,400 a month or something like that, which again is sizable. I think at that point, it was about the 25% of our income thing. And over the course of owning that house in LA, I have made between 180 to 200. We're probably closer to like 210 now in rents. And though that's how much I would have paid to a mortgage had I not house hacked. And I've been able to roll that, you know, let's call it $200,000 into the portfolio that I have today. And it's really just catapulted like where I am today. So it's all because I wasn't paying a mortgage. So you know, that that's kind of a very practical example. If you can save your monthly mortgage and use that to invest, I always think that's a really great starting point. Now, what's the difference between a house hack and just having a lot of roommates? So for example, my my wife and I were married for a whole year and we had like three roommates. We were musicians just getting started in this tea business we were trying to build. And is that a form of house hacking, would you call it? Or is that just simply renting it out to other people that you don't know? No, that's a house hack, man. I mean, a house hack very simply is, uh, you know, you subsidize your mortgage by renting out a room or a space in your house. It doesn't even have to be a room if you don't want it to be. I mean, a really popular form of this is having a roommate and renting out your room. Another, you know, the, the origins of Airbnb was like, you know, air bed and breakfast. And the air in that means air mattress. And people would put air mattresses in their living room and rent it out for 20 bucks a night. And I really appreciate that. So if you look at my house in LA, for example, that studio that I was telling you about wasn't even really much of a space. It was like a crawl space that the previous owner converted into what's called a bonus room. And that we were renting that out and we were able to, you know, make, I think on that one, two to three thousand dollars a month just, you know, out of the forty four hundred dollar mortgage that we had. So there is no technical, I mean, it's not a technical term. No one's really mandating like the terminology, but I think someone pays you to live on your property for a, any amount of time while you live there, that's a house hack. I love that. One, one of the best examples I've seen personally of this is uh, my mother-in-law, after post-divorce, she had this house that was big and a lot of overhead and she was going to debt every single month. She finally sold it and then found this house where she could build a little apartment downstairs. And that now pays her mortgage. She put enough of a down payment. She kind of overpaid that down payment to get her monthly mortgage very low. 
and now it covers it and completely turned her financial situation around. It's, it's incredible. So if you're in that kind of position, <laughs> it's yeah, possible. Definitely. And it's, it's really cool to see that turn around. So sticking on the idea of those early days, I was reminded about this book that Damon John wrote, and it's called The Power of Broke. And when you're starting from scratch, it can be a huge advantage in the long run because it teaches you to be scrappy and resourceful. But I'm actually curious if you found yourself in a position where you've needed to relieve yourself of those tendencies in an effort to scale, because sometimes it can be ineffective over time. Oh man, dude, this is this is the struggle of my life, dude. If I'm being completely honest, like this is the thing that really is the greatest bottleneck of of my current, I don't know, a life stage. And dude, I, I when I was getting started, I didn't have a ton of experience or money. Like, you know, if you watch the content on any of my platforms and you go to the comments, a lot of people are like, oh, it must be nice to be a trust fund baby and this and that. You know, and I'm always like, oh man, if only you knew that. My parents were immigrants. My dad was a doctor in Mexico. He left that behind and worked minimum wage for for most of his career just to support us. So, like, I didn't come from money and I had to pay for my own college with student loan debt. So, I was really broke and I was always made fun of by all of my friends, Um, not for being broke, but for being like, well, for being broke, but in the sense that I was always trying to get a deal, like they were always like, oh, here he is trying to get the free meal. Like, you know, if a conference let out and they had ordered food at, at, at my company, for example, I would always be standing at the meeting room, like waiting to get like the leftover sandwich or whatever. And so people were just always like, oh, Rob's the deal guy. He's always trying to get a deal, you know? Um, and so now fast forward to today and my income is, it's really great. Like for, from where I started to today, it, it's a, a, a life-changing difference. And I'm still just so cheap. Like I made a video about this on my YouTube channel not too long ago called like the world's brokest millionaire. And it's really talks about how if you're a really good millionaire, you strive to be broke. And so what I, what this means is you strive to be broke because instead of spending money on yourself, you're always trying to funnel that back into your real estate business or whatever entrepreneurship ventures you have. And so before that though, before, you know, my, my, income had grown with my real estate portfolio. I was just, I was broke. Right. And then I actually started making money and I just funneled my brokenness right into like all of my investments. And so now I, I, I really, I feel guilty spending any money on myself. And it's something that I am working on, to be honest. Like I don't have to treat myself this way. Like I can like order the avocado on my, on my salad for a dollar 50 and not cringe so hard. But for some reason, I'm still fighting that, that, broke mentality of like, oh, you know, it's 500 bucks. I shouldn't spend that. And so recently I've started making more strides and understanding that, you know what, when it comes to Airbnb, for example, I've got like 16, well, I guess now I actually have 36 units because I just closed on a, on a motel. But at a certain point, you don't have time to scrutinize every single expense. And it actually costs you more money to do that than to just pay the first available vendor to get your AC fixed. Because if you don't do that, you're going to have to refund the guests their entire stay. And it always ends up being a wash. So little by little, I'm trying to work on just spending the money on, on kind of convenience and spending the money on a quick solution versus trying to get three vendor quotes uh, and waiting a week before I make any kind of a decision. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, they say time is money, right? And that's that's mm-hmm. what I think a lot of people overlook. Sometimes they spend endless amounts of time researching something just to get a discount. And you're like, well, you could have just you know, <laughs> saved yourself the time. Dude, this just more. happened to me, man. Um, this is a really great example, okay? I My pool filter broke and my home warranty is supposed to cover that. And so I paid the $65 that came out and they said they they sent someone out and the person said that it was broken because of a faulty you know installation whatever he didn't even look at it he just wrote that up and so i have spent the last 2 months dude like fighting my home warranty company to fix this dang part and honestly the part was 500 bucks and we have not used our pool at all and we've been very frustrated about not using the pool and i was like Finally, like literally a week ago, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to pay the 500 bucks. And I felt really dumb in that moment because I was like, well, the result was the same. I paid the $500. Had I paid it two months ago, 
then I would have been able to use my pool for two months, which would have contributed to, you know, the happiness of like our life. Cause we use the pool like all the time. So that was a, a lesson for me that I was like, all right, you know what, man, why am I fighting over like the amount, if you just value your time and you assign an hourly rate to your time and you start to think about that. I mean, I spent 10 hours fighting this insurance company or the warranty company, and I was out a lot of money just in my time. Yeah, I have some of ex- I have some stupid examples of that myself, where I was delivering like a case of tea all the way to like Malibu or something by yeah, myself. Yeah. I drive like an hour out to just deliver one case, and you start being like, well, I should just hire someone to do this kind of stuff. It's an interesting transition, though. It really is. I can relate to that feeling of being broke, especially when you're building your dream. I actually have this memory where I'll never forget. I was driving home, and I I literally had zero dollars in my bank account. And I'd really love to dive deep into the trenches here and give our Mm -hmm. listeners a visceral idea of what it felt like to be in that position when you're just starting out. Hopefully you weren't as broke as I was at that point, but can you describe a moment in time where you were both, you know, full of hope and then also full of doubt and uncertainty? It was a very long time before I was full of hope from a financial standpoint, you know, Coming out of college, I'd worked a few internships in the advertising world. I was a creative copywriter and my wife's a teacher, which, you know, they, you know, they make great money. And so I think when we first started our jobs, I was making, oh man, I want to say like $40,000. I had negotiated that up from 38,000 and I was like, woohoo, I'm rich. And oh, cause that was my first real paying job. And my wife was making about 42, um, cause she was a specialized teacher and we thought, oh, you know, like $80,000 roughly. We're good. Like this is great. But when you start stripping away taxes, you know, I think we were contributing like 1% of our income to retirement savings. You start taking away the thousand dollars in student loan payments and the thousand dollars in mortgage costs and then anything unexpected, you know, I think we were left at the end of the month with like a thousand dollars of quote unquote discretionary income. We weren't saving when you don't make money or you don't have a lot of money left over, you can't save it because you're scared to, right? You, you you feel like moving it over to your savings account makes you more broke, even though it's you know it's all in the same place, right? And um, I remember this one time, my wife was transitioning from being a nanny, which she was right before she got her her teaching job, um, and she went from that, which was paying like fifteen dollars an hour or something, to being a salaried teacher. And we were like, okay, this is it. Like, this is what we needed. Thank goodness, because you know we had a lot of credit card debt at that point. I think we had like sixteen. $20,000 somewhere in there and high interest credit card debt, by the way. And um, I remember the way that the financing worked with all that, or like with the payroll is they weren't super clear on if my wife was going to get paid in two weeks or in four weeks. And that was a, that was a big deal for us because the student loan payments came in on the 15th of every month at that time. And I remember I was, I kept, I was like, Hey, do you know, do you know, like, are you going to get paid in three days. Hey, are you going to get paid in two days? She's like, I don't know. They like, they won't answer the question. They don't really know. And I remember her mom was like visiting that day on the 15th. She flew in to come and see us. And I remember that was the day she was supposed to get paid. And we were laying in bed and she like, like I had just woken up and she was looking at her phone and she checked the bank account and she was like, Hey, I didn't, I didn't get paid. And I was like, Oh no. I was like, dang, what are we going to do? We had like I think we had like at that time like a hundred bucks in our account or something like that. So not not quite uh, not quite you know what you were going through, but not super far. I mean, it's effectively the same thing, right? We had enough for a couple of Chipotle burritos, but I remember that was like the next two weeks were the longest two weeks of my life because I was so petrified. I was like, literally, if there's like an auto payment on my credit card or if there's some bill that I have on auto pay that I have forgotten about, we're gonna overdraft and we're gonna have to pay the twenty five dollar fee, which we didn't have. And uh, that was, you know, real hopelessness for us at that point, right? Because, yeah, it was just like, how do I get out of this? Like, advertising copywriters make good money as you go up the scale. You know, you can jump up from 40 to 50 to 70 to 90 to 100, but it was going to be years, like a decade. And I remember thinking, like, oh man, the day I make $100,000, I'm going to be set. It's going to be so great. And, um, you know, that was tough for us. But I think, the real shift when I finally was like, oh, this is it. Like, I think I figured it out was when I rented my first Airbnb apartment. I was doing what's called rental arbitrage. And I don't do that much now, but that's how I got my start. And basically, we had just bought a house in LA and we had our, our 
apartment lease that we were in and we were going to have to pay $2,000 to break it, which is a lot of money, by the way, for us at that time as well. And I was like, we can't afford the $2,000. So we're just, let's just throw it on Airbnb. I was like, I've heard of this thing um, that you can rent your house to strangers apparently and they'll pay you. And my wife was like, are you sure? Like, are you sure you can, that that's going to work? And I was like, no, definitely not. But I can't, we can't pay the $2,000. And our first reservation came in and it was for like, 1500 bucks and our rent was $1,800. And that was for like a two week reservation. And I was like, Oh my goodness. If I get another two week reservation, I'm going to make like $1,200. That was a life changing amount of money because that was our student loan, like for the month, our, our total like loan balance on that. And I was like, this is crazy. And then the day before they were going to check in, they canceled their reservation. And I was like, Oh my goodness, I, we are screwed. And like, Within an hour or two, another reservation came in that was like sixteen hundred bucks. It was like a hundred dollars more, and for that same day, and I was like, "Oh, okay." And that was the day I told myself, "I'm going to be a millionaire from Airbnb." I love that. Let's go into some of these things you've thrown out there. These terms: so rental arbitrage, house hacking, Airbnbs, long-term rentals. You've even talked about land hacking. I, I've learned from you now about that. And I'm kind of curious where you recommend people would start. If, if there is any kind of roadmap, I know it's all kind of dependent on preference. Sure. sure. But as far as like, you know, any asymmetric opportunities, where, where do you find those the most? Yeah. So we'll start with the house hack, right? I covered that. A really great graduation of the house hack is like a duplex house hack where you live on one side and the other person lives in the other. There's no cross contamination between your life and the guest life. So that's really nice. Um, I did that. But I mean, when I started out in Airbnb, I didn't have money to buy my first investment property. And so I did what's called rental arbitrage. So basically you lease a place and you, you release it, you sublease it on Airbnb. And so if you're, you know, your daily amount on that lease is like, let's say 50 bucks a, a day. That's a $1,500 lease, right? Um, you would want to rent it out for $75 a day and mark it up 25 bucks. And if you did that for the full entire month, that would be like a $750 profit. That was a really great way for me to build up cash. And I think it's a great stepping stone for people. I honestly, like if you go on my channel and Instagram and all that stuff, like I teach all my students, if you will, the art of building your wealth through Airbnb. And they all ask me about rental arbitrage and they're like, how do I do it? I don't teach it quite as much because there are things about rental arbitrage that I like and I don't like. Um, I don't love that rental arbitrage is a temporary business, meaning when the lease is over, the business is over and now you got to figure out what to do with all that furniture. Um, that's why I like buying houses and kind of investing in those homes because then I, I the lease is never going to be over. I own it. Right. And I just have more significantly more options. Like if short-term rentals are regulated, for example, I can convert it to a long-term rental and you know, it, it's not as lucrative, but I can still do that. Or I can sell the house and make my equity back. Whereas with the lease agreement, you're not building equity. Um, you can't really mitigate too much against regulations and, you know, if your lease is over, if your landlord decides to sell the house, you're sort of out of that business, right? But it is a really great way to get started because it can help you build up cash flow. If you can find a landlord that will agree to it and they're fine with it and you can pitch them and they're then they're like excited about it, it's a very lucrative uh, way to, to kind of build cash flow. Um, cash flow is really, really easy, easier on the rental arbitrage side because your costs are typically going to be a little less because you have a maintenance crew at that apartment, for example, they cover the maintenance and everything. So that's a that's an interesting place to start. Um, I like people starting uh, in a way that subsidizes their life. Um, and there are a few ways to do this. Like one really powerful way to do this would be through a second home uh, loan. And, and there are specific uh, like criteria that you have to follow. But an example of this would be with a second home loan, you can put down a 10% down payment. And you can get into a property. Now, in order to do that, though, the criteria and the guidelines say that you have to occupy the property for a portion of the year. Most underwriters will dig into the guidelines and say that that is going to be between the two and three week mark, right? So you have to stay in your property between two to three weeks a year. Now, there are a lot of people that live in an area that travel a lot, right? So like, let's say you live in LA. Well, there's Mammoth, there's Big Bear. And if you're a skier, 
Um, you're going to be spending a lot of money on Airbnbs going out there. But hey, what if you could just buy your own Airbnb out there? You could buy your own house. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to buy the house because I'm only there for five, five weekends a year. And it doesn't, justify, it doesn't justify the actual expense of the mortgage. So for those people, they can actually use it as their second home. But anytime they're not there, they can actually rent it on Airbnb and not just break even, but make a lot of money. Like I know a lot of people that make between fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a year of gross profit in those towns, for example. Uh, I don't have anything out there, but I, that's just a really good example. Or for me, Joshua Tree. I was living in LA and I wanted to build a tiny house in Joshua Tree, so I built a tiny house out there. It's only two and a half hours out there. I get to visit it, I get to enjoy it, and I can let my friends and family stay there. And that is my second home, right? That is one of my second homes, and I was able to do that, right? And and I can I can justify buying that home because other people will pay the mortgage on Airbnb for me, and I get to make a really decent profit on that property too. So I think that's a really powerful way to do it. And if you've wanted to buy a vacation home, but you, you run through that same exact, you know, I guess, uh, dissonance of like, oh, I don't want to have this mortgage over my head. That's a really great example of how to get started in the Airbnb world and start cash flowing and actually get to use it for your own personal lifestyle. Let's talk about cash flow, actually. So a lot of people get into this game, I think, for that exact reason to just have extra disposable income or have it cover your mortgage, as you said. But how do you rank the importance of cash flow versus the appreciation when you're approaching a real estate deal? Yeah, definitely. So there, there's a sliding scale on this. Okay, so it's not again. There's no right or wrong. It's what's right for you in the moment that you're in. I think for most newbie investors and for most people getting started, what is 100% the most important thing is cash flow. And there are a couple reasons for this, right? Everyone wants to make a little extra money. And that's why we're getting into real estate, right? So if you, you know, want to uh, make a thousand bucks a month, you get you want to buy a, a place. Like you want to buy a place, make a thousand bucks a month. You know, you're not really as focused on like, oh, well, it went up five thousand dollars in value this year because it's quote unquote paper money, right? It's not really liquid. It's there in the house. You have the equity, but it's not something you can actually cash in without doing like a cash out refi or a HELOC, which we'll get in, you know, we we'll possibly get into that later. So cash flow is really important because people want to make that side income. Cash flow is also very important for most newbie investors because most people that are getting into real estate have one dream, right? They want to quit their nine to five job. They want to leave their W2 job so that they can just be their own boss. They can be an entrepreneur. And real estate is a very clear way to do that. And so when you're making $50,000 a year, for example, like, like I was at a certain point, well, it's not hard to figure out how you can make $50,000 a year on, in my niche, in, on Airbnb, right? Uh, my tiny house, the tiny house I was just telling you about in Joshua Tree, the first year it grossed $83,000 for the year. The profit after all of my expenses, after all of my property taxes, cleaning fees, repairs, everything, $57,000. Now, my management on that is less than an hour a week because it's a new construction. A lot of stuff doesn't go wrong. It's like really, really great. And if I had told younger Rob that, hey, you're going to be making $57,000 a year doing not a lot for this little house that you bought, you're going to make more doing that than this like job that you went to college for, my mind would have exploded. I wouldn't even have believed you, right? Like It would have to be me telling younger me, and being like, I time traveled here, you know, because it's just so like not, it's not something I could comprehend, comprehend when I was younger. So when you start thinking about that newbie investor, they start dreaming like, okay, how can I make 50,000? How can I make 60, 70, $80,000 a year, you know, with real estate so that I can quit my job. And so because of that, every time you add a property to your portfolio, every time you add, you know, units, you know, more doors, right. You're starting to kind of math everything out and say, okay, that's an extra 200 bucks a month. That's an extra thousand dollars a month. And so you're just focused on how you can get from zero to $10,000 a month. That always seems to be the magic number for a lot of people because you know not only do they want to leave their job, but if they can make six figures, it's a really great achievement. And so $10,000 a month, you can do that, right? But there comes a point where if you're a, a real estate investor and you're a pretty good one and you're, you're, like, you're like us, right? You're like me, you're cheap. Then at a certain point, you cover your expenses even if you start making more money, you don't necessarily want to spend it because you're a good real estate investor that's cheap, broken, frugal, right? And so for me, 
there came this point where I was like, well, you know, here are my expenses and I don't really want to pay myself for real estate. And so I did everything I could to not use my cash flows to supplement the growth of my portfolio. And I think a lot of people uh, that I know, they're usually pretty strict on their budgeting in, in real estate. Most real estate investors are like, there, I really respect that we as a community, like we thrive on on brokenness, right? Because we just want to keep, you know, chipping away at the dream. And so at a certain point, what becomes more important in my mind is appreciation. And that's why I say this is a, a bit of a sliding scale because you start off on the left here, a cash flow. That's so important. But as you grow in your journey and as you progress, you know, let's say linearly, that little slider starts moving over and moving over to the appreciation side because you quickly realize that cash flow makes you rich but appreciation makes you wealthy and i'll give you an example of this i worked my butt off for the last 5 years to build my airbnb portfolio and i got my cash flow up to about $25,000 a month to probably more now but just, let's just use that as the as the benchmark $25,000 a month times 12 is $300,000 a year which is amazing. It's so cool, right? Like I, I did that. I tripled my salary just with Airbnb. Now consider this in the last year, if you take the appreciation of all of my properties, all 14 of the units, 15 of the units that I had, they all appreciated $400,000. So I actually got a hundred thousand dollars more added to my net worth from the appreciation of my Airbnb properties than the actual cash flow of it. And so it's not about one or the other. You want both, right? But there becomes a moment where it's like, okay, 25 grand a month. That's really cool. I'm going to stash that away. I'm going to keep investing it. But then you look over and you're like, oh my goodness, like the actual value of my property is actually, I've made more that way. And if that happens over the course of your portfolio, like your portfolio in 30 years is going to be worth double, triple, right? It's going to be worth so much more. And ideally you get both, but what's really going to add to that final net worth number, if that's something that you're adding to is the overall appreciation. So it's a little bit of both, but one becomes more important at the end. Once you realize that the generational wealth you're building comes from appreciation. I want to touch on what you just said there about not using your, I think it was your salary income to kind of, you know, supplement or use your, your Airbnb income to supplement, mm -hmm. you know, your, your lifestyle, you, you chose to reinvest it. And I was learning, I was talking with this guy named Adam Cecil and he had these two uh, phrases, you know, growth mode and harvest mode. And I really liked that concept because it is it, probably a certain stage where you're building and you're building, and you're just reinvesting, reinvesting, and you, you don't really feel the difference in your lifestyle. And then as soon as you turn on harvest mode, where you can kind of let these things kind of auto run by themselves, that's where you kind of see the freedom kind of kick in or, or the wealth effect go into to play there. Was that kind of your experience? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this kind of goes into the whole me being like, un, like self-imposed brokenness, I guess is the, the best way to put it. Like I didn't have to be this way, but growth mode for me for the last five years is kind of where I've been at, right? Like growth mode, growth, like how do I grow? How do I grow? How do I grow? And then, yeah, like the harvesting component of it, it's like the way you grow is by taking the money and using that to reinvest. I probably could have paid myself a little bit earlier, but for whatever reason, it just, I was able to be so frugal and live off of my W-2 income that, yeah, it just for me, it's really cool to, to grow your monthly cash flow. That was like a really cool thing for me. And I really liked that. And the fact that I could get to $25,000 a month and not ever actually take away from that, that was like a cool thing for me. Like that's, that to me has been a great joy to be like, yeah, that's, that's a number I'm really proud of. It's funny you say that because I was talking to, to Jim O'Shaughnessy and we were talking about that. I think it's a Harvard study about immediate gratification, right? And the, the best investors seem to have this gene where they, they're able to put off the gratification, right? You were, you were staying in that self-imposed brokenness for longer knowing that one day down the road, it would pay off. And that's the mentality I, I relate to because I was always, you know, my twenties starting my business being like, I don't care how hard it is now. It's going to be easy in my thirties. Like I'd rather have it be hard now and easier later <laughs> than, than the opposite. So mm -hmm. when, when we're talking about the passive income though, I, I'm curious how passive it really is. So for example, I, I looked you up on Airbnb. I noticed all your properties are very highly ranked. You're a super host. Um, you know, my wife doesn't stay in any Airbnb less than like 4.9, you know, a rating. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like it takes a lot of work to maintain that, right? You're getting comments and you got to be really communicative with your 
guests and I mean, talk to us about the actual work that goes into these properties to maintain a status like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are some people and some gurus in the space and stuff like that that are like, yeah, it's completely passive, you know, and it's not, I mean, it's not totally passive, but it, it, it can be pretty close. You know, I, I think it's like at the end of the day, if you hire a, a property manager, for example, for your long-term rentals, that's completely passive, but you are going to pay a, a management fee on that. Short-term rentals is the same way. I mean, I could hand my properties over to a property management company, but they're going to charge me anywhere from 20 to 30%, which is significantly more than a long-term rental. And it is because there is more work. I'm a big advocate of self-managing because I think that you can automate enough to sort of understand the business and enjoy the business. So when I was first getting started, I was messaging guests. I was texting my cleaners. I was arranging everything. I was ordering supplies. And that kind of stuff does you know, work when you have one property. But as you start to scale and grow, it, it really it's, things start slipping through the cracks pretty quickly. So for me, what I found is there are things I can automate. So I was able to automate, for example, my messaging, right? So instead of sending a message to my guest when they confirmed a booking, when they checked in, to check in on the mid-stay, to check out, to leave a review, that's five messages that you're going to send to one guest, right? If you have, let's say, 10 guests in a month, that's 50 messages to, to one property. Now, if you have 10 properties, that's 500 messages that you're going to send. So what you can do is actually use a property management system that will basically template your, you know, like a, a, a response or like template, like a check-in message or template, like a checkout message. And so you obviously want to tweak those to be in your voice and everything like that. But that was one thing where I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't know you could do this. This is amazing. Uh, another component of my short-term rental business that I was really in the weeds on was changing the prices of my property. You know, I was like, oh, you know what? Uh, I'm not being booked this week. So I'm going to drop it down to $99 a night. Uh, oh, hey, you know what? I think there's a festival coming up in a month. I'm going to jump it up to $300 a night. Oh, shoot. Someone just booked my place for $99 a night yesterday for that festival because I didn't really think about the festival until after they booked. Dang it. I could have made an extra $500 there, right? That's sort of the pricing dilemma that a lot of hosts go through. You can actually work with a like an automated dynamic pricing tool that will give you the optimal price for your Airbnb given the supply and demand of the market on any given day. So if they see that it's the season where everybody is coming out to LA, for example, it's the hottest season in LA, they know to drive those prices up because supply is probably going to be pretty limited. Um, so you know that's one way that I was also able to automate my business. Uh, instead of having to leave reviews, which is something you have to do with every guest, I'm able to automate that through the same thing, a property management system where not only can it just auto generate the review for me, but it will also send them a message and say, hey, if you enjoy to stay, will you please leave a review for me? You can automate your supplies, right? If you set up an Amazon subscribe and save you know, a subscription, you can automate paper towels and toilet paper to be delivered every single month. And so you can also automate communications with your cleaners. If you don't want to be texting your cleaners through the right property management system or through the right product or, or service, you can actually pay like, I don't know, $10 a month or something like that. And it will shoot over a calendar link to your cleaners so that it syncs up with their calendar. And they know when people check in and check out, they can get an email sent to them. They can get a text sent to them. So really, I don't ever hear from my cleaners unless something is wrong. If something is broken, uh, if something is super dirty, if something needs maintenance or repair, they'll let me know. And at that point, I'll deploy like a, a handyman to go fix it, right? So just in all of those things that I talked about, you can cut like 80 to 90% of the time wasted and you know the time spent doing all of these things and yeah you got to you got to have a human element for 10 to 20% right but it's worth it because then you don't have to pay 20 to 30% to a property management company on $83,000 I can't tell you exactly what, I mean, $83,000 is roughly off the top of my head, $25,000 in management fees. If I was going to pay someone a 30% fee, that's a lot of money. Like I would rather just make that and, and spend 10 to 20% of my effort managing that property. So it's starting to make less sense for me now. I'll be honest because I have my YouTube channel. I've got host camp, my mentorship program. I've got like my actual properties, bigger pockets, like businesses that I'm starting. So it doesn't really make as much sense for me to be doing that. But when you're starting out and cash flow is important to you, then you better be self-managing because that can make or break how you know successful you are in your first couple of years. That's incredible. I had no idea you could automate 
that much of it. That's fantastic. Well, while we're on the topic, why don't we go through a couple of the characteristics of what make a great rental property? You've got what you were just describing. There was opportunity costs. And when it comes to real estate, there's endless amounts of opportunity costs. You can look at any right. state, any country, any city. I mean, it's like, how do you whittle down the universe? You know, How do you uh, zero in on somewhere that you know is going to be a good outcome? Hey, everybody. Trey Lockerbie here from We Study Billionaires. And I wanted to tell you about a new company that I absolutely love, and that is called Trade. Trade combines two of my favorite things, coffee and technology. So what you do is you go to drinktrade.com. There's a super simple survey that you take, and then it tells you which coffee they're going to send you that you are literally guaranteed to love. Meaning if you don't love it, they'll send you a new bag of coffee for free. And from there, you can keep experimenting so you're not falling into the same rut of drinking the same coffee over and over and over again. There are so many different types of roasters, levels of roast, beans from different parts of the world. There's plenty to nerd out on here. So why not be adventurous and try some new stuff? After I took the quiz, they sent me a bag from Sight Glass Coffee in Northern California, and it's literally my favorite coffee of all time. Normally, I've been drinking a coffee where I have to sweeten it with honey and almond milk, but this coffee, I could actually drink it black. It was so delicious just on its own. And right now, Trade is offering subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking the quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let Trade find the perfect coffee for you. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off. So there are four main places that I find myself investing in. There are national parks, state parks, vacation destinations, and eclectic towns. Now, I don't really have to talk too much about national parks or state parks. We all know what those are. But the reason I like them is that they are they're nature's Disneyland, right? You know, like you don't have to market the Grand Canyon. You don't have to market the Smoky Mountains. Smoky Mountains, people, it's literally eight hours away from like half the US population, right? 13, 14 million people visit the Smoky Mountains every single year. And that's over a million people a month, just over, right? There are 3,000 rental cabins in the Smoky Mountains. So if you really look at how many people are visiting every single year compared to the actual supply of cabins, like there's a discrepancy, right? And so that seems to be the case in a lot of these national park and state park areas. So that's why I found myself investing in like Smoky Mountains, Joshua Tree, stuff like that. But I also really like eclectic towns. Eclectic towns, um, I don't have a lot of properties in these yet, but this is kind of like my next strategy moving moving forward. But they're kind of these small towns that just have some kind of draw to them, like some something magical about them or something enchanting about them, right? Like really great example of this would be like a Eureka Springs in, in Arkansas, right? It's like this little small town that's like very touristy. It's like this long one or two mile road and there's all these little shops. Um, I just went to another place in, oh man, and right outside of Denver, I think it was like Pueblo and same thing, right? It was like pretty much identical to Eureka Springs. Um, Julian outside of San Diego, it's like this this cool little town where people go apple picking. There's like really great pies. Uh, you know, the people love taking photos in the fields, all that kind of stuff. Outside of Austin or Dallas, there's like Waco. Um, it's right in between, right? So Waco has like been popularized by the late great Chip and Joanna Gaines, obviously. Like, you know, it wasn't super popular before that show and it's growing and it's, it's exploding from a tourist standpoint. People go there. Uh, they did all the marketing for you. You don't have to do it, right? So these eclectic towns have some reason for people to, to go to and you don't have to market them. And then last, lastly would be vacation destinations. So these are going to be your your beach towns, your lake towns, your mountain towns, anything where people are just going, right? They're going to hop in their van with their family and drive or tourist destinations like LA would be a tourist destination because there's Disneyland and there's also Hollywood, um, you know, Orlando, Disneyland, you know, I talked about mother's Disneyland, but you know, some would prefer to just go to like, you know, uh, the human species Disneyland. So that would be like the four areas that I think determine, like a, a good, like those are good jumping off points. I think if you want to start getting into the Airbnb or like rental property game. Now I've been tempted with other stuff too, like uh, RVs or Turo, even where you can rent out your car. Mm-hmm. Or I know some I've people done it. just have a fleet of cars now, right? So yeah, yeah, I what did are it. You, what are your thoughts on actual real estate, like rental properties versus RVs, Turos, etc.? Yeah, so there's a there's a company called Outdoorsy. 
and they're sort of like the trailer version of the trailer RV version of Airbnb. I haven't actually done it. I would like to do it, but I have nowhere to park the RV. Um, but I think it would be really fun. I've been wanting to do it for a while, not because I, uh, not because I have a strong desire to, but I just like, dude, what I like to do is like make information accessible to people as much as possible. And that's like a big passion of mine, like just being on the bigger pockets platform, right? Like I get to talk to a lot of people and teach them how I did it or YouTube or TikTok or Instagram. I like to teach people. And so with something like outdoorsy, for example, I sort of want to do it just so I can be like, all right, I've failed so that you don't have to. And I think it's a really cool way to do it. I've done Turo before. Turo um, was a little bit more of a grind for me because I only had like one car. And like when I rented it out, I was like, you know, having to bum a ride for my wife. And then I'd have to Uber when she wasn't around. It ended up being a wash. And then I got two cars And, you know, whenever I rented one, I needed the other. I had like a truck and a Prius. I was like, oh, these are going to be great options. But it always landed on times where I needed one or the other. So I figured out to really scale on Turo, you probably want like three cars Um, and just a car outside of it, you know, like your personal car and you can rent them out. And that's where you could really start making money. Um, I think it's a really great business. It's an interesting business. If you're somewhat of a car fanatic, and you like to have cars, but you don't want to pay for them. That's ultimately what the sharing economy comes down to, in my opinion. The reason I have Airbnbs is because I like to have properties that I don't have to pay for. You know, I bought a luxury, like $3.25 million luxury house with David Green, and it's an amazing dream come true. And I don't really have to pay for it, right? Other people are paying for it. Outdoorsy, if you want an Airstream, an Airstream is going to cost you between fifty and eighty thousand dollars to buy, and if you don't want to pay that, you can just rent it out to people when you're not using it. And you're guess what? You're not going to be using it for like ninety nine percent of the year. So if you can make a little money, great, subsidize it. If you want to buy, if you want to have a truck and a Prius like I did, great, like you can rent those on Turo and at least break even on those. Or if you want to have a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, I know people that do that too, and they you know they make really great money on Turo because they rent out their stuff for like a thousand dollars a day. So it's a really interesting way to subsidize it. I think to really scale that. I mean, there's some obvious issues here, right? There's like the depreciation of your car. It's not an appreciating asset, which is why I always end up going back to my first true love real estate, like buying things that are an appreciating asset. Anything on wheels is not really an appreciating asset. And that's sort of where there's a little bit of dissonance with some of the things I say on my channel and like the tiny home community. You know, I always talk about, hey, look, my tiny home in Joshua Tree is on a fixed foundation. And because it's on a fixed foundation with a fully permitted structure and it's got the certificate of occupancy and all that, it's a real living, breathing piece of real estate. A tiny house on wheels is just a really nice trailer that's going to lose value over time. And that makes a lot of people mad, but you know, we, we, I can't make everybody happy. But you know, all, all to say like, Anything on wheels is a depreciating asset. Doesn't mean it's not a good business, but it's not necessarily something that's building wealth other than the argument of saying like, yeah, you use your cash flow to invest in other things. Yeah, I, I love that point. I, I used Turo as sort of a, an excuse or, or, or a way to um, justify the purchase of the car I own today thinking, oh, well, you know, I'll pay down some of this just by renting it out. And then the first time I I had it listed and someone rented it. I freaked out. I was like, I don't, I don't want, the, I don't want them <laughs> yeah. driving my car. <laughs> just, yeah, I know. just pulled off of it. I couldn't do it. So, you know, I want to ask you about uh, regulations as well, because, you know, Lake Tahoe near me is one of these places that you know, would probably be a dream Airbnb rental place, but I think they crack down on it because at certain points, you don't want the whole town, I guess, all being Airbnbs, which makes sense, right? Sure. Yeah. But yeah. so, where are the most like uh, owner friendly? areas to invest for Airbnb purposes? Mm, I wouldn't say there's like a a particular kind of place, but I I definitely think like areas that are in the national park, state park kind of category are going to be those places because you got to understand like national parks, they make their money on tourism, right? And so if they limit how people can like the accessibility people have to lodging, which is usually very limited in these areas, then they know that they're going to be cutting off a large part of the tax dollars that we pay to them. So the Smoky Mountains is a really great example of this because the entire economy is 
boosted literally by 13 million people going there to visit, right? The handymen there get paid from all the short-term rental operators. The contractors get paid from there. The cleaners get paid from there. Literally every aspect of that economy is boosted by short-term rentals. Now, of course, there are regular residents there, but those re- those residents are often, you know, vendors or subcontractors for short-term rental operators. And so if, you know, Sevierville, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge tried to limit that, they would effectively be, you know, sort of cutting off the income of all of the residents that live there and depend on that income, right? So I think these vacation destinations are a really great place to pay attention to because typically, you know, if they do impose some kind of regulation, there will still be ways, not around it, but ways to comply with it. Joshua Tree is a really great example of this. It was kind of the wild west out there for the last like five years or so, but now they've imposed regulations that only allow a owner to own two properties out there. And so, you know, that kind of cuts back on how much you can do, but now if you know the rules, at least you can play within those guardrails, right? I actually think sometimes it's a little scarier to play in a place that hasn't even regulated it at all, because then all of a sudden it might say, oh, you know what? We ban everything. And then you're like, oh shoot, I have a whole portfolio here. So personally, my investment strategy is I just diversify the heck out of my listings. Um, I've got 14, 15, li- oh, I guess, like I said, I've got 35 listings or so, so that 20 unit hotel. But outside of those, we'll call it like 15 listings. Um, I live in the same state as one of them, and they're all over the place, you know, like literally like four or five different states. And I've just diversified so that I know, hey, if, um, Joshua Tree really just completely lays down the hammer and they don't want me to be a short-term rental operator there. Okay, I've got a couple options, convert to long-term rental, sell it, whatever. But at least I've got 14 other units across the country that I can rely on to pick up the slack. I just thought of something. I haven't heard this talked about really at all. So I'm curious if you have real estate in the major metropolitan areas, LA, New York, et cetera, just skyrocketed in the last few years. And it seemed overheated to begin with even before that. But, you know, there's a lot of talk of that just being because of the money supply that was introduced, et cetera. Part of me is kind of curious if the amount of Airbnbs out there is contributing as well. One source I found said it was 700,000 total Airbnbs in the US. And you got to imagine most of those are in major metropolitan areas, I would think. I mean, I'm not really sure, but maybe a lot of them, given the, that they have the attractions you kind of mentioned earlier. And I wonder if that kind of takes away the supply and then boosts the real estate around it. Do you, have you ever had any discussions about that with your guests? Uh, I mean, my TikTok comments have certainly had discussions with me. Um, you know what? I think looking at the numbers, it has a little bit smaller of a like a percentage than people make it seem. Like I think people... like no one's really on the same page here well, A, when they're against me, right? Like half of my TikTok comments are like, you're causing housing prices to skyrocket. And then the other half are like, you're decreasing property values. And I'm like, can y'all just talk and like agree on like what you're mad at me for? Um, it obviously is going to contribute to like taking some housing stock out there, but it's a pretty small percentage. Like the last report I read was, I mean, closer to like the one to 3% mark, which is obviously like, not insignificant because one to three percent of the housing stock is like really, 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 really high, but you know, you know, relative to the amount here, but it's not really quite as uh, I don't know. I think the there's a little bit of a agenda there sometimes of bringing down hosts, like you know, they're like, You're ruining neighborhoods and taking things. I'm like, I don't know, man. My neighbors like are they love they kind of like like it because they all Airbnb too. Because when you think about like the common person in a neighborhood like mine, for example, in LA we were just trying to make an extra couple thousand dollars a month. And like, that's literally what both of my neighbors are doing. They both also have bonus spaces under their house. And it's like, they make a couple thousand dollars a month from it and they love it. You know? And I think that most Airbnb operators are doing that. Um, For me, I don't invest a lot in metropolitan areas. Honestly, sometimes for this reason, because I think it's just easier to say, like, you know, I like I, I invest a lot in glamping stuff, for example. No one can really get mad at me for opening a, a glamp site. Like it's a cool tent out in the middle of the desert and um, or like a cool tree house or whatever. I'm not really taking like any supply away from people. And so people are, are usually less mad at me for starting like a glamping site. And same thing with like new constructions. Like I built my tiny house in Joshua Tree, you know. I guess you could argue that like, quote unquote, it was 
taken from me or like taking that stock, but I built it for myself. And so for me, like the niche that I'm always trying to target is what can I build so that I just own it? And like, you know, I'm not going to rile too many people up, you know, over. And then I also try to be in a place where there is already like a need for more short-term rental housing, like the Smoky Mountains, for example. There are 3,000 cabins, million people go every single month. There's just not enough supply. So for me, I'm always like, okay, can I like invest there and contribute to the the tourism economy there? And that economy is very friendly to it because that's how they make their money. So I don't know if there's like really a right or wrong answer here, but I do at least give it thought, you know? That's really interesting. All right. So I have a silly but deceptively serious uh, question to ask you. Perfect. When it, comes My favorite Air- kind. <laughs> when it comes to Airbnbs, how important is adding a hot tub? Oh God. Oh man. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, my POV here and you just want to rile me up, but it is important. And I hate hot tubs because they are just the thing that everybody wants that everyone gets mad about that causes the most issues. So look at reports say, all right, reports do say you make more money every single year with a hot tub. You can add as much as $39 to your ADR, your average daily rate, if you have a hot tub. With that said, you must ask yourself, how important is that extra $39 a night? Because oftentimes the hot tub's going to break. Uh, it's going to flip the breaker. It's not going to heat up fast enough. It's going to be a little green. There will be one leaf in there. There will be a guest that doesn't know how to use it and they break it. And a lot of refunds will come out of it, right? But most of the time, it's like a net positive thing. But man, if you kind of like look at the side of my head here, I've got a few gray hairs and they've all they've all come from hot tubs, like from, from the maintenance and <laughs> the mitigation I've had to do with hot tubs. <laughs> I love it. All right. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the financing side of real estate. I want to ask you, what are the most common or actually maybe least common hacks when it comes to financing a rental property? One of our co-hosts, Robert, I know has bought a property with zero cash down, I guess, after refinancing some appreciation. Mm. There's some kind of these workarounds that some people find and I find it fascinating. Do you have anything like that that already experiences doing something like that? Yeah, I've done a, I've done a few kind of creative solutions. Um, one way would be uh, similar to what you were talking about. Um, I'll use my LA house for example. Uh, I've got a home equity line of credit on that thing for one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. If I actually redid the application or whatever, I think my home equity line of credit would be closer to like half a million dollars. So if I can't qualify for a home, I know that I could take out a HELOC and just use that to purchase my property or use that to buy a property, rehab it, and then go and do a cash out and get that money back. That would be like one way to do it. Another way to do it would be what's called a DSCR loan, debt service coverage ratio. And that's where they basically, instead of qualifying you based off of your DTI, your debt to income ratio, and qualifying you um, off of your like income, they're qualifying you based on the projected rental income of that property. So if I am self-employed, like I am now, it's a lot harder for me to get a mortgage from a bank conventionally. But with the DSER loan, they don't even look at my self-employment. They look at the projected income and they say, okay, this property will cover the debt service. So we'll we'll lend to you on that. Um, another way would be um, what my favorite way, how I was able to scale up pretty quickly, and that's OPM, other people's money. Partner with people and they can pay and acquire the property. And your payment to the partnership is sweat equity. You know, my first two partners that I ever worked with, you know, I used to put myself out there on Instagram and say, Oh, I'm doing these Airbnbs. Like, look at this. I make, you know, this money. This uh, Airbnb made $2,000 a month. It's a dream come true. And like, I, I was like very proud of like the small successes. I was having in short-term rentals and I would have people reach out and say, Hey, uh, I see that you're making good money. I hear this is very lucrative. Like, how can I get involved with this? And I would say, well, Hey, if you can buy it, I'll help you find it. I'll do all the communications with the realtor, the appraisals, I'll furnish it and I'll manage it. And I won't pay myself back until you get paid back fully. That was back when I started the terms of that are a lot, a lot different now, but a lot of people, they, they really like that. And so I was able to get into several properties from those types of agreements and it was just using other people's money. Now, if you're starting out, you may not be able to negotiate a 50-50 equity split on that. Um, you might have to start small. You might have to take 25% equity and they take 75 and you have to pay them back first before your equity vests. Like That would be one way to do it. But for me, I, I've really found partnerships and joint ventures and other people's money to be a very successful way for me to scale up pretty quickly. I'm glad you brought up that point about 
qualifying for a mortgage when you're self-employed. I've had that experience and it's the system is so backwards. I've found being mm-hmm. a business owner, my employees have a better access to mortgages than I did. <laughs> and it's <laughs> yeah, just, man. it's so backwards. Uh, I find it just fascinating. Okay. So let's talk about the appreciation side of things. How should people think through values of their property or properties in general now that mortgages are finally rising and rising rapidly? Yeah. yeah I mean, in terms of what they're investing in or how they're holding on to the property? Say they're trying to get into the market, right? And they're, they've been watching it and now mortgages are going up. Where are the values going to go from here, I guess, in your opinion? Yeah, I think, I mean, look, everything is very cyclical, obviously. And historically speaking, we have peaks and then we have dips, right? And the only way that you can ever uh, circumvent that, right? Or like the only way you can ever really beat the dips and, you know, like, I don't know, be successful in real estate is to invest consistently and not have a two to three year trajectory. A lot of people think real estate is a get rich, you know, quick scheme. And it's like, oh, I'm going to make money so fast. I'm going to be a millionaire overnight. That's not true at all. Like you have to think of real estate as the long game, just like your stocks, right? Just like your, your 401k portfolio, for example, if you invest a thousand dollars a month, every single month for a year, and you make a 10% return on that, like the, just a perfect, you know, like let's say an average great year, whatever, you're going to make 120 bucks on that. That's not really a lot of money. It's not going to make you super, super rich. But if you do that for 30 years, that is going to grow into millions of dollars, right? And real estate is exactly the same way. You can't really get into it expecting, oh man, I'm going to make so much money like today. And then in two years, I'm going to triple it in four years. It's not bad to goal set, but if your exit strategy is three to five years from now, you've already lost the game. You have to think of your exit strategy 20 to 30 years from now, because that's the only way to ever quote unquote time the market, right? Is by being, is by having more time in the market. So I think for people that are looking to invest right now, there are a few ways to do it, but at the end of the day, you just have to work a little harder for your deals. You know what I mean? Like interest rates right now, I think they're finally, I think they came down recently and they're around six, six and a half percent for investment ones, for investment ones down from like seven. I'm sure it's going to go back up here pretty soon. But with that said, like you just have to work harder for a deal, right? And you have to negotiate harder for your deal and you can't overpay. But if you really kind of examine the behavior of people, it ends up being a wash in a, in a sense. And I want to clarify that a bit. Like two or three years ago, there are a lot of people that were saying like, oh, we're in a bubble. Like, I'm not going to buy now. It's the top of the market. Well, interest rates were three, 4%. And now home prices might be softening a bit, but now the interest rate is higher. And because the interest rate is higher, you'll technically spend more money in interest, but you paid less for the house. But it's kind of the same thing. Like if you had just invested both times, it's the same thing. And so instead of trying to like time the market and, and really be like very precise, the best thing you can do is never overpay, never spread yourself too thin, have reserves to cover any kind of storm, and just do it consistently forever. That is it. That's the secret. That's the the really obvious secret that a, a lot of people just don't really think about. It's like you might have a good deal. You might have a bad deal every so often, but if you really strategically think about it consistently, the good deals will typically help kind of uh, mitigate the bad deals that you might have over the course of 30 years, hopefully. I want to provide a little math breakdown here because uh, just to add some context. So I heard that the average home price now in the US is $500,000. So if you're looking at a $500,000 home and you had a 2.8% interest and assuming you're financing 400,000 because you're putting 20% down, you'd end up paying around $200,000 in interest over 30 years. So a total of $700,000 $700,000 at the end of 30 years. Now at a 5.8% interest, now assuming you're still putting 20% down, the home price would have to be $375,000 to get that same $700,000 net cost over 30 years or a 25% decline in the in the home price. Do you think we're nearing something like that? It's 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 a similar question, but I guess what I'm trying to ask is This isn't like a 2008 scenario where the market is overheated and there's going to be a big collapse, but we are seeing interest rates rise. And do you think there's going to be that kind of decline or does the demand and the lack of supply kind of keep propping it up from here? I'd rely on, 
you know, the fact that understanding there are dips and there are peaks and I've invested a, a lot in the the peaks, right? But I'm actually looking to invest more right now. And I think that honestly, the the number breakdown that you just gave us sort of exemplifies my point, right? So like you said, I think if it goes down 25% to 375, the interest is still basically the same, right? That's one component of looking at this equation is, okay, the interest is, you know, you have to have a better deal here for it to like, you have to have a better deal today at the higher interest than, you know, like a year ago, right? The, the first interest rate you gave. But that's kind of looking at it one way. But I think the other way to look at it is less in the interest that you're paying overall and what that house is going to be worth in 30 years. And so it seems scary when you put it that way, right? Like, oh my goodness, like I have to spend 125 grand less or whatever the number was in order to pay the same amount of interest. Like, oh man, I, this is a bad deal. But the question you have to ask yourself is, what will that house be worth in 30 years? Is it going to be worth double? Is it going to be worth triple? Probably. Like the equity will still be favorable no matter kind of like the difference there in price. As far as where we're heading, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I would like to think that A, like the actual pricing is softening because we did get into a moment there where people were just paying like, especially in the Smokies, like 50 to $200,000 over because they just, they were like, yeah, this is it. Like the glory days. And I was like, no, man. Don't ever pay two hundred thousand dollars over that. It rarely makes sense in, in any economy. But kind of what where I think things are going right now is at the end of the day, like there's one really big problem in the U.S. and it's supply. Like just straight up, it's supply. The they, we're not making houses fast enough. The houses aren't there. People are buying houses, and so that makes me feel a little better because if I, if I felt like we had a, a housing overage, I guess, instead of a shortage, then it'd be like, uh oh, like what are we gonna do? Fact of the matter is everyone is still competing pretty aggressively just to get into an investment property or just even like their own primary residence. You mentioned bad deals a minute ago. I just have to ask, have you ever had a bad deal? And if so, what what did that look like? You know what, man? Not really. Um knock on wood, great. <laughs> let me just say one thing on that really fast. Mm -hmm. A lot of my properties have been acquired over the past five years. And the cash on cash returns on a lot of those properties have been between 30 to 100%. Like it's really crazy. Like, like my tiny house is a really great example of it. Glamping is another great example of it, spending $3,000 on a tent and making like 80 grand on it. Like that's, it's insane, right? Now, nowadays today, like I am targeting deals that are 20% cash on cash return, which is a lot less than what I was getting before in like the glory days. And now, like, Right now with the way interest rates are, I might be getting like a 15 and then in an apocalyptic scenario, like a 10% cash on cash. And so in my mind, if I had told younger me like, oh, it's a 10%, I would have been like, oh God, don't show me that. That's a horrible deal. But now that I'm a little bit more seasoned in the investing world, 10% is still really good. 10% <laughs> is like, if I can get that, it's like, that's the gold standard, right? But if I can double it with the short-term rental or 1.5 with like a 15%, I'm so happy with that. Younger me would have said that's bad. Today, I'm like, eh, it's not as good as I had it, but it's still a, a relatively good return. So that's what I consider bad. Anything less than a 10%, I haven't had any of those yet. That's a really interesting point because you often hear the stock market's performance on average is, I don't know, anywhere from 6 to 10%, depending on if it's adjusted for inflation and a number of other things. So it sounds like in your worst case scenario, you're kind of coming down to that stock market level performance or settling for that which is kind of interesting to me because mm -hmm. you would expect that you would want to be striving for those 20 or 30 or even greater percentage uh, yields because it's an illiquid asset, right? So you don't have that luxury of being able to pull your money in and out of, it's like, say, like you do with the stock market as easily. So is there a consideration there? So when it, in, a, in an environment like this where we're getting into that 10% range, does part of you at all kind of start thinking about the stock market a little bit more? Only because of the dip in the stock market, um, because right now would be a great time to get into, you know, like the S and P 500, which I'm maxing out my 401k because I'm self-employed. I got an S corp, you know, and I have a retirement account through that. I max that out, right? Uh, I pay as much as I can to the S and P 500. It's the only one I really care about. They've they've done the due diligence to get all the best numbers there. So I'm like, yeah, I don't have to. I don't have to research it. Uh, same thing with crypto. I'm buying, I want to buy a lot of crypto right now because like Bitcoin is like so cheap. Um, so to answer your question about like, should I be thinking about it? Yes, in order to just like 
diversify a little bit, but no, in the sense that the stock market is really illiquid in certain capacities. Sure, you can sell your stock and get that money back, but the capital gains that you have to pay on that are going to be crazy. Whereas on real estate, there are a lot of tax strategies that you can enable to where you may not have to pay taxes because you can defer them through like a 1031, for example. And so there's just so much more uh, tax gymnastics that you can play, I guess, um, with the real estate game and how you do things. Like I think that enables me to grow my wealth a lot faster through leverage. You can do a cash out refi with real estate, right? You can, if your house appreciates a million dollars, you can go out and get 75% of that if you own if you own it outright and get a $750,000 home equity line of credit. You can do a cash out refi and do the same thing. You can't really do that with stocks and crypto in the same capacity. You can stake your crypto, I guess, but then if it goes down in value, I think it's called being liquidated or something like that. You could lose a lot of that crypto if that crypto dips below kind of the today's balance, right? That stuff's not really going to happen in real estate. If I go out and take out if I do a cash out refi and there's a correction, and the house is no longer worth that. I mean, I still have the money that I took out of it, right? So personally, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to diversify and I am, but there's just so much, so many more tools available to me through real estate that I'm really putting a significant amount of my time and effort in that. I have a question around the 1031 you just mentioned. Is that the thing where you sell a house and you have like a year to in- reinvest it in order to not pay capital gains on that or any kind of tax on it? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little, it's a little less than that. It's like 45 days, I think. Um, okay. So basically like, let's say you, you buy a house, we'll call it like, let's say you buy it for half a million and then it appreciates to a million. Um, and then you sell that house, you have a profit of $500,000 and you would have to typically pay capital gains on that $500,000 profit. Now with a 1031, you can take that $500,000 profit and basically go and reinvest it in another property and defer that tax that you'd have to pay. Now, if you sell that property, then you would have to pay those taxes unless you use the profits and the money from that to go and 1031 it again. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it because I'm not a tax expert. Make sure you consult your your tax expert. There are a lot of limitations or definitely things that you have to keep in mind when you do it. But from a, a simplicity standpoint, it's basically moving your tax bill down the line through real estate. I want to go back to what you said earlier about loving to teach. What is it about you that makes you want to teach other people all these things that you're learning and, and kind of learning as you go? You're sort of teaching as you go as well. I think for me, man, I didn't have anyone to teach me. There wasn't a YouTube channel called Raw Built at that time. And I, I was listening to Bigger Pockets. And the reason I know so much about real estate is because of what I learned from the podcast, right? What I learned, like as a listener, not even as a host, just as a listener, what I learned in like the forums and getting in there and connecting with people. But there wasn't a lot of literature on short-term rentals. You know, a lot of the the real estate world and education out there is just general real estate education, long-term rentals, multifamily syndications. And so I really like I struggled. I had to learn stuff the hard way, man. I, I really did. And so I always tell people that I learned the hard way so you can learn the easy way. And so I'm really transparent on my channel about how much money I make, uh, if I've lost money, uh, what kind of properties I have, where I buy them. I'm transparent to a fault. And I probably will be protect a little bit more protective of certain information because it, it's becoming more of a privacy issue at this point. But I try to teach everything. Like I, I wear my portfolio on my sleeve, if you will, because I just know what it's like to be a lonely short-term rental operator. And, you know, I had my business partner, but aside from us, like in the trenches together, there weren't a lot of people to communicate with. There weren't a lot of people to learn from mentor, like short-term rentals are a little competitive. Everyone's nice to each other, but they're like, don't worry about where I'm investing. I'm not going to tell you anything. Like, and they, a lot of people keep stuff close to their chest. And for me, I just think that there's enough out there for everybody. And if you win, I win, you know what I mean? So, um, it's a really great Testament to me to just teach people because it's also just very touching and moving that people reach out to me and say, I've had people reach out and say they've quit their job because of starting their short-term rental business that they learned from like, like my program or my channel or anything like that. And when people send me those DMS or emails, I'm like, I'm really moved by that. Cause I'm like, great. I'm so glad I could do that for somebody. Uh, cause I didn't have someone to really do that for me in the short-term rental space. Now, obviously real estate, like Brandon Turner, David, obviously 
influenced me a lot, but I didn't have a mentor. And so if I can play that role for somebody, then uh, I think that's pretty gratifying. That's amazing. You mentioned bigger pockets, which has become this massive show, the real estate focus mostly. And you and I have a similar story here in that we just have become the co-hosts of these podcasts. What was your story about becoming a co-host of bigger pockets? <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, you know, my bucket list, like to my Super Bowl bucket list, right? Like if you could send Rob to the Super Bowl in his respective world, what would that be? And it was to be a guest on the Bigger Pockets real estate show. And when they reached out to me, I want to say it was about a year ago. I am a dude, I was like through the roof. I was like, oh my God, like I, I'm going to be on the Bigger Pockets show. This is crazy. Because I already had my YouTube channel and it was relatively established, but this was just such a new level of a pride that I could I could possibly be showcased on a show like that. And I was really excited and I had all my things prepared. And I was like, if they ask me about YouTube, I'm going to say this. And if they ask me about that, I'm going to say this. And I had it all prepared and it didn't go anything according to plan. And uh, I remember being like, wow, man, I, I really beefed it on that one. And at the end of that episode, Brandon Turner was like, man, you know what, Rob? This is an amazing episode. And I think you're going to, I think some lives will be changed based on what you said. And I was like, oh, okay, thanks, man. And I was like, no, he's just saying that because I really, I didn't do a good job. And I had a lot of people that reached out to me immediately after the show aired. A lot of people followed me. A lot of people sent me nice messages about like, man, I didn't know you could do this and all that stuff. Tony Robinson, like another co-host on the rookie show was like, bro, you killed that. And I was like, oh man, really? Thank you so much. I really needed to hear that. So that was like my story, right? I was like, okay, I guess that's my thing. Maybe they'll have me on some other time. And uh, I was shooting a pilot for HGTV like back in October. And um, we were kind of in the final negotiations for that. And I was just like, yeah, okay, it'll be cool to have a show. But, you know, there were some complications there, I think. And then, um, yeah, I got a phone call like that same week. And it, they were basically like, hey, we, would you be interested in becoming the, you know, like possibly filling in for Brandon Turner? And I was like, Burr? me? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean fill in? And are we talking about the same Brandon Turner? And then we're talking about me. Like, I don't understand. Can you just give me a little bit more context? And they're like, haha, you know, yeah, if we, we like this and that. And like, I was just flabbergasted. I had no idea what was in store. I, I just couldn't believe it. I got that phone call and I was like, I don't want a show. I, a show would have been cool, obviously. And, uh, and they didn't end up picking it up by the way. So that that's fine. I wasn't really bummed even one percent i actually didn't want it after they called me i was like oh my god if i could do bigger pockets like that is truly that is better than a show because it's like i'm actually talking to people that like need the advice versus people that are just i don't know watching my show on some random southwest flight right like it never never sees the light of day other than some random you know airplane license and so i was just like so excited and yeah i got i i um I got the call and like, yeah, they officially offered me the role and it has been a, a dream come true and a life-changing thing. And people are very nice. And luckily, like <laughs> no one in the comments are ever too mean or anything like that. So it's been pretty weird, man. Um, it is a dream come true. And it's honestly like such a dream come true that I'm like, what other dreams should I have? I don't even know. Like that was, I had dreams. Like I had a, sh the show was a dream at the time, like a TV show. And then when Bigger Pockets came, I was like, oh no, that, I mean, I didn't, it's basically like, basically if I was like, Hey man, have you ever dreamt about owning Pluto? You'd be like, no, why would I dream about that? That's such a dumb thing to, it's not, it would never happen. That's kind of how the bigger pockets thing was. So, so out of this world that I was like, man, I, I don't even know how to process it. And to be honest, I'm still processing it. Congrats on that, man. It's so cool. Of the guests you've had on the, that show to date, does anyone stand out to you? Uh, it's made the biggest impact on you that you've learned the most from. Have you walked away from an episode yet being like, wow, that was a, uh, that was really something. Yeah, there are a few. Um, we did the one, we did a show with Ed Milet not too long ago. And I just thought that that was, oh man, that guy is smart, man. And he had a lot of great wisdom to say. He was kind of one of those people that, um, do you ever have like a podcast, like guest that's so good that like you sort of forget that you're doing a podcast and then they stop talking and it's your turn to talk and you're like, oh, that's right. We're doing a podcast. That's kind of how it was with Ed Milet, where I was like, oh, that's right. I should talk now. Um, that was a really, a really, really, really great one. Um, 
this actually will sound very cheesy, but it's genuinely very, very true. We did a show with Brandon Turner. That one just came out. And that was like my first real, like, like in uh, in depth conversation with him. And it was all about social branding and like how to use that in your benefit in the real estate world and stuff. And I thought that was really cool, man. I was like, wow, man, he is exactly who I had hoped he would be. And it was just very like, um, I don't know. It was really, really cool to just see, to be in the room with, with, uh, Brandon who like helped pioneer the space, you know what I mean? And I thought that was really cool. Um, I actually, the interview we did with you, I think it's, I think it just came out by the time this comes out. I thought that was a really great episode too, because it was really nice to talk about. Come on, (laughs) No, no, I'm serious. Like, look, you got to remember, like we talk about, you know, a lot of similar concepts on bigger pockets. And when you came on, we talked about things, in the real estate space, but a little bit outside with like the economy and Bitcoin. We talked about Bitcoin for a decent amount of time, which, you know, kind of bleeds into digital real estate. And I just really like when we have like that, because it's a really refreshing take on a a similar industry. We had another friend of mine named Cody Sanchez on, she buys businesses, real estate adjacent business. Yeah. And like we had her on the show and it wasn't exactly like, Hey, here's how to start a real estate business. But it was like, here's how you start a business that's adjacent to real estate. You know, instead of like uh, just operating a car wash, own the real estate under it. And that to me was a really interesting way to to think about it. So we've had a lot of guests on the show. And really, I would say half of them have that effect on me where I'm like, oh, that's right. I should talk. But they're just so good. Everyone is so good that comes on the show that it uh, gives me gives me a little imposter syndrome, if you will. You just described my my exact experience as well. On this yeah. show. Imposter syndrome through the roof. Man, Rob, this was so much fun. I could do this all day with you. This Same. is so fun. I've, I've learned a ton. I really know very little about real estate and and I've really enjoyed this conversation. Scratch a lot of itches I've been curious about for a long time. So I know our audience is probably uh, the similar in some way and they'll get a lot of value out of it as well. So before I let you go, you did share a couple of resources already, but I'd love for you to share maybe your favorite books, maybe the services you you mentioned, uh, the property management system. If you have any recommendations of stuff like that, uh, any other res- obviously bigger pockets, any other mm-hmm. your YouTube channel, any other resources you want to share? Yeah, man. Um, so I would say real estate uh, books would be David Green's book, uh, Burr, the buy rehab, rent, refinance, repeat book is really great. Um, that one actually applied to me a lot as an Airbnb host because it talks about building systems and how to do it out of state and you know how to hire contractors and everything. And it's actually more applicable to, to Airbnb than you'd think considering it's a remodeling book. Um, I, don't, I don't read a lot, to be honest. I watch a lot of content. Um, so if you want to you know, uh, follow me along on my ADHD entrepreneurial journey, you can go over to the Raw Built channel on YouTube. Uh, you can follow me over at, at Rob Built on Instagram. Uh, Host Camp is my my Airbnb mentorship program. If you're interested in learning about that, hostcamp.com. Some of the tools that we talked about today, um, Price Labs is one that I use for uh, pricing, uh, dynamic pricing. Guesty for Hosts is one that I use, that property management system that I use. And uh, obviously, the Bigger Pockets forums, if you actually want to connect with people and and learn about you know, what other people are going through. You can go and talk to people, connect with people there, bigger pockets on Instagram and on YouTube. And yeah, I mean, oh man, I don't know. I, I may have over promoted literally everything on this planet, but ultimately I think if you're looking for a foundation in real, in real estate, consider listening to the bigger pockets real estate show. I mean, that's, we talk about everything and every, everyone, and we talk about all the different asset classes and niches and everything like that. So I think if you're looking for a way to dip your toes in the water, that podcast will do it. Fantastic. Well, Rob, congratulations again on all the success. I'll be following along. I love the YouTube channel. It's highly entertaining. I highly recommend it. And let's do this some other time. I appreciate it. Please have me back on. I'll be on anytime you want. Sounds good, brother. Okay. Cheers. Cool. Bye. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 